This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 21, The First Dice Game. Last episode marked a high point for our heroes. The brothers succeeded in winning the submission and tribute of all the kings of the world, and Yudhishthira successfully accomplished the Rajasuya sacrifice, making him the emperor of the world. As the sage Narada had predicted, the ceremony did not go off smoothly. Things really went off the rails when Bhishma chose Krishna to receive the top honor among all the illustrious guests. Krishna's old rival, Sishupal of Chedi, was particularly outraged, and he let everyone know why he disapproved. Typically, you would expect the highest honor to go to the highest ranking or most glorious king among the guests. No one would have been surprised if King Drupada of Panchala or Dhritarashtra or Bhishma had been chosen for the honor. But Krishna was a real nobody. What proof did Krishna have that he was even a born Kshatriya? He claimed Prince Vasudeva was his father, but would have appeared to everyone that he was just the son of the Shudra chieftain Nanda. If you didn't believe that the creatures he had fought as a child were demons in disguise, you would think he had only killed some animals, a woman, and had damaged an old ox cart. Regardless of what the kings in attendance really believed, Krishna ended the argument when his killer frisbee took off Sishupal's head. At the end of the ceremony, when all the kings had departed for their homes, only Vyasa, Duryodhana, and Shakuni were left. Before Vyasa departed, Yudhishthira asked him whether Narada's predictions of bad things had ended with Sishupal's death. Vyasa replied that on the contrary, the bad times had only just started and would keep coming for 13 years, culminating in the destruction of the Kshatriya caste. When Yudhishthira realized that these things could not be avoided, he decided to do what he could so that at least he would not be blamed for whatever bad things might happen. His solution was to swear a special oath in which he promised to be nice to everyone and to be totally obedient to his family. Little did he realize that this very oath would lead to the destruction he feared. After Vyasa's departure and Yudhishthira's oath, only Dhirodhana and Shakuni were guests at the Pandava palace. Hijinks ensued when Dhirodhana toured the palace and was tricked by glass doors and crystal ponds. His cousins Bhima, Arjun, and the twins all laughed at him when he fell into a pool of water. As Duryodhana journeyed back to Hastinapur, he grew increasingly disconsolate, complaining to his uncle Shakuni how he had been humiliated and that a man of his rank could not possibly tolerate the success of his rivals and still live. He told Shakuni that he would either see the demise of the Pandavas or he would kill himself. Duryodhana's first thought was to assemble his brothers and allies and attack Indraprastha. Shakuni was quick to point out that this could not succeed. He said that if they had not been able to defeat the Pandavas when they were friendless orphans, then it would be impossible to do it now. Shakuni then promised an alternative to warfare. He said that Yudhishthira was addicted to dice, but was also a very bad dice player. Shakuni, on the other hand, happened to be an expert at dice. He told Duryodhana to have his father arrange a dicing match against the Pandavas. For whatever reason, Duryodhana was unwilling to broach the subject with his father, and he asked Shakuni to bring it up. And so, the next time Shakuni was with the king, he informed him that his son Duryodhana was not doing well at all. Shakuni described the prince as having turned pale and having lost the will to live. The blind king then turned to his son and asked him why he felt so miserable. What could he possibly have to complain about? He lived in wealth and comfort, ate meat daily, and rode the finest horses. The boy complained that the pleasure of life had lost its luster now that he had seen the great wealth and honor enjoyed by his cousins. He described to his father how all the kings of the earth were like mere commoners among all the illustrious Brahmins and sages. There was a ceremonial conch which was blown every time a hundred thousand Brahmins had been fed, and Duryodhana had heard that conch blowing constantly, day after day. Shakuni then spoke up, suggesting that they have a dicing match with the Pandavas, again saying that the Pandava was a bad dicer, while Shakuni was the best in all three worlds at the game. Duryodhana quickly seconded the idea, saying, This man knows dice, and he will be able to take away the Pandava's fortune. Please allow it. Dhritarashtra's first instinct was to check in with his prime minister and younger brother Vidur, but when he mentioned that to his son, Duryodhana flipped out. He said he might as well kill himself now, because there was no way Vidor would agree to this plan. The king went ahead and ordered the construction of the new gambling hall, but not without reservation. He told his son that he did not approve of this course of action, and that it would be likely to lead to the destruction foretold at the time of Duryodhana's birth, but still he could not deny his son's request. 
By the time Vidor found out what his brother and nephew had in mind, construction was already underway. Vidor wrung his hands in consternation and predicted disaster if this plan went forward, but there was no stopping it now. Poor Vidor was then ordered by his brother, the king, to lead a delegation to Interpasta and invite the Pandavas to come and play a game of dice. Vidor did as he was told, and after a formal greeting took place between the king of Interpasta and his uncle, the prime minister invited his nephew to view the new gambling hall and to compare its grandeur with Yudhishthira's supernatural palace. Vidur also openly warned the king about Duryodhana and Shakuni's evil intentions, saying, I know that this game will bring disaster, and I have made an effort to stop him from it, but the king has sent me to your presence. You have heard, you are wise, now do what is best. Despite the warning, Yudhishthira agreed to attend the dicing match, saying, It is the king Dhritarashtra's request, so I will not refuse to go to the game. A son will always respect the father, so I shall do what you tell me. I am not unwilling to play against Shakuni. Once challenged, I will not refuse, for that is the oath I have sworn. The oath he is referring to is presumably the one he made earlier this episode, when, to avoid responsibility for the disasters predicted by Vyasa, he swore to be obedient to all his relatives and to accept all challenges. Yudhishthira also simply blamed fate. Just like Dhritarashtra, he decided to go along and let events follow their own course, whatever the outcome. The king then ordered his household to proceed to Hastinapur, including himself, Draupadi, and his four brothers. On arrival at Hastinapur, the brothers were welcomed with all the usual formalities and then shown their quarters where they bathed and stayed for the night. The next morning, they were taken to the dicing hall to begin the game. At the hall, they were greeted by Duryodhana's uncle Shakuni, who welcomed his victim and praised the game of dice. Yudhishthira disagreed and said, Gambling is trickery and evil. There is no knightly glory in it, nor is it good policy. Why do you praise dice? No one praises a gambler's trickery. Shakuni took exception to this insult to his art. He shot back, A scholar defeats a non-scholar in learning, and that is not a trick. And a smart man outwits a dullard, and no one calls that a trick. You have come to me, so if you think this is trickery, then desist from the game, if that is your fear. Again, Yudhishthira referred to his oath, once challenged, I will not desist. That is the vow I have taken. I am in the power of what has been decreed. Let the game begin. What is the stake? Duryodhana answered, I shall stake my gems and my treasures, and Shakuni, my maternal uncle, shall play for me. Yudhishthira said, For one man to play in another's place does not seem fair to me. You know this, so accept it. Now, by all means, let the game begin. When the game was all laid out, all the kings and nobles of the court, including Bhishma, Drona, Kripa, and Vidor, unhappily took their seats in the audience. Yudhishthira then began the contest by staking a costly string of pearls. Shakuni then rolled the dice and cried out, I've won. Yudhishthira said, You have won this round from me by confusing me with the trick. All right, Shakuni, let's play a thousand times. I have a hundred full jars with a thousand gold pieces each. My treasury holds inexhaustible gold ore and fine gold aplenty. That is my stake, king. I play you for it. As soon as this was spoken, Shakuni again cried out, I won. The gambling match continued in this way, with Yudhishthira each time raising the stakes and Shakuni winning every round. Yudhishthira bet everything from fancy chariots to herds of war elephants, slaves, livestock, and treasure. At this point, Vidor felt compelled to speak up. Standing before King Dhritarashtra, he called on the king to recall the bad omens they had heard on the day of Duryodhana's birth, and he asked the king to stop the game immediately. He reminded the king that he had been advised to give up Duryodhana. To save a family, give up a son. To save a village, give up a family. To save a country, give up a village. To save a soul, give up the earth. Vidur urged Dhritarashtra to resist his paternal instincts, send Duryodhana away, and ally himself with his virtuous and powerful nephews. He predicted that if the injustice of this dice game did not end right away, that war would be inevitable, and the Karavas would be the certain losers. Duryodhana did not like hearing this at all. He responded to Vidur's plea, You always boast, steward, of the fame of our foe, and secretly revile Dhritarashtra's sons. We know whose friend you are, Vidur. You despise us all as if we were fools. Shakuni then asked Yudhishthira, You have lost vast wealth, king. Tell me, what wealth have you left? It turned out Yudhishthira still had lots of wealth, and bit by bit, he bet it all and lost it all, including his own personal jewelry and the clothes he was wearing. Yudhishthira then staked his brothers one by one, 
starting with the youngest Nakul, and lost them all. He then staked himself and lost that as well, making him and his brothers all slaves to their cousin Duryodhana. Thus bereft of all his possessions, and having lost his own freedom, Shakuni asked him what else he had to stake. Before Yudhishthira could respond, Shakuni suggested that he stake Draupadi. There is still your precious queen, and one throw is yet unwon. Stake Krishna of Panchala and win yourself back with her. Yudhishthira said, She is not too short or too tall, nor too black or too red, and her eyes are red with love. I play you for her, eyes like the petals of autumn lotuses, a fragrance as of autumn lotuses, a beauty that waits on autumn lotuses, the peer of the goddess of fortune, Yes, for her lack of cruelty, for the fullness of her body, for the straightness of her character, does a man desire a woman. Last she lies down, who was the first to wake up, who knows what was done or left undone, down to the cowherds and goatherds. Her sweaty, lotus-like face shines like a lotus, her waist shaped like an altar, hair long, eyes the color of copper, not too much body hair, such is the woman king, such is the slender-waisted Panchali, for whom I now throw, the beautiful Draupadi. Come on, Shakuni. When the Dharma king had said all this, all the nobles in the hall groaned in horror. But blind old Dhritarashtra was exhilarated, and could only keep asking excitedly, Has he won? Has he won? Karna, Dushasan, and their cronies were warming to the idea of having Draupadi as their slave, but everyone else was in tears over the injustice. Shakuni did not hesitate. He rolled the dice, did his trick, and cried out, I've won. The game was over. All was lost. Duryodhana took charge, calling to Vidur, Steward, bring me Draupadi. Let her sweep the house and run errands. What a joy to watch, her with the serving wenches. Vidur refused to do this, saying, You are hanging over a chasm and you don't know it. Krishna Draupadi is not a slave yet. I think she was staked when the king was no longer his own master. A plague on the steward, Duryodhana said, standing up. He turned to his usher, Asuta, son of a bard, and ordered him to fetch Draupadi from her quarters. It was not so easy for a servant to disregard Duryodhana's command, so the usher went meekly to Draupadi and informed her that her husband had lost his mind and had gambled away both his own and her freedom. It so happened that Draupadi was in confinement during her period and was dressed in a single strip of cloth. She asked the servant how this had come about, and he described to her how he had first gambled away his kingdom, then his brothers, and then himself, and finally his wife. Draupadi told the usher to go back to court and ask the assembly who had been lost first, Yudhishthira or Draupadi. If it had been the former, then Yudhishthira was not free to stake his wife. The usher went back and posed this question before the kings. Yudhishthira did not respond to the question, his eyes closed as if he had lost consciousness. Duryodhana then replied impatiently, Let Krishna of the Panchalas come here and ask the question herself, and ordered the usher back to retrieve the former queen. Now terrified of angering the princess of Panchala, the usher declined to fetch her, saying, Who am I to speak like this to Draupadi? Duryodhana angrily dismissed the usher and turned to his younger brother, Dushasan, who was eager to see the humiliation of his rival's queen. He stood up and went straight to Draupadi's quarters. Angrily, he ordered Draupadi to go to his brother. All right now, Panchali, you are one. Look upon Duryodhana without shame. You shall now love the Kurus. You have been one under the law, so come along to the hall. Wiping her pale face with her hand, the fallen queen stood up, but instead of following Dushasan, she ran to the queen Gandhari's room. Dushasan followed after her with a roar and grabbed her by her long black tresses and dragged her to the hall. As she was being thus led by Dushasan, she told him that she was having her period and was only wearing a single cloth. The princess protested that she was not in a proper condition to come before the kings and nobles. Dushasan responded that she was now a serving girl and even if she were naked, she would have to obey the instructions of her new masters. He then pulled her into the hall and announced that the slave was present. Karna and Duryodhana laughed heartily at her humiliation, while everyone else present was horrified at the spectacle. Draupadi then turned to the eldest and most respected person in the assembly to rule on whether she had indeed been fairly staked and lost by her husband. Bhishma's brains were strangely addled, and he was unable to judge on the fairness of her treatment. He complained to Draupadi that the law is subtle, and that a man without property cannot stake anything, but yet a man's wife is his property. Having no one else to speak on her behalf, Draupadi argued her case, pointing out that Yudhishthira had been ordered by his elders to gamble and thus had no choice. Dushasan cut her off with insults and crude remarks. 
Yudhishthira, meanwhile, just sat there like a beaten dog. Bhima, on the other hand, could not remain silent any longer, and he upbraided his elder brother. Gamblers have not been known to even stake prostitutes in their games, because they respect even these low women too much to commit such an outrage. When the king staked and lost his brothers, even that could be tolerated, but to see their innocent wife treated this way was too much to bear. Arjun then scolded Bhima for speaking out, saying, Never before have you said words like these, Bhima Sena. No one may overreach his eldest brother by Dharma. The king was challenged by his foes, and, remembering the Dharma of a Kshatriya, he played at the enemy's wish. That is our real glory. At this point, seeing the grief of the Pandavas and the torment of their wife, Vikarna, King Dhritarashtra's youngest son, spoke out in their defense. Remember, Vikarna was Dhritarashtra's 101st son, whose mother was a serving maid. Vikarna called out to the presiding nobles, Ye kings, answer the question that Yagyasena's daughter has asked. We must decide, or we shall go to hell. Bhishma and Dhritarashtra are the eldest of the Kurus. They are here, but they say nothing, nor does the sagacious Vidur. Drona and Kripa are here, but even they, the most eminent of Brahmins, are not answering her question. All the other kings and princes here should shed their partisan feelings and speak up as they think. Consider the question that beautiful Draupadi has raised repeatedly, and whatever your opinion, make your answer. Despite Vikarna's pressure, the nobility were silent. Finally, Vikarna spoke up on his own judgment. If you will not answer the question, then let me tell you what is right in this matter. There are four vices which are the curse of kings, hunting, drinking, dicing, and fornicating. A man with these addictions abandons their dharma, and the world condemns his immoderate deeds. The Pandava was under the sway of his vice when these gamblers challenged him, and he staked Draupadi. This innocent woman is held in common by all the brothers, and the king staked her after he had already gambled away his freedom. It was Shakuni who suggested Krishna when he wanted to stake. Considering all this, I do not think she has been won. I should point out that Draupadi is one of the four people called Krishna in the Mahabharata. Vyasa, Arjuna, Draupadi, and the Krishna. Perhaps to make sure no one confused the illegitimate son of a serving maid with himself, Karna, the illegitimate son of Kunti, then derided Vikarna's speech. While most of the guests in the hall cheered Vikarna's speech, Karna shouted them down, saying, I hold that Draupadi has been won fairly, and so do your betters. You are still a child, yet you speak out before your elders. How can you say she has not been won when the eldest Pandava staked all he owned in the dice game? Draupadi is a part of all he owns, so how can you maintain that Krishna has not been won? You complain that she was not handled properly by bringing her before the court clad in only a single cloth, but I disagree. The gods have decreed that a woman shall have a single husband, but she submits to many men, and as such is just a whore. Thus, there is nothing strange about bringing her here scantily clad. Even if she were completely naked, it would be fitting for her. Karna then called out to Dushasan, who was still holding Draupadi by her hair. This Vikarna is only a child, babbling of things he doesn't understand. Strip the clothes from the Pandavas and Draupadi. The Pandavas meekly did what they were told and stripped to their waists. Dushasan then grabbed Draupadi's sari and gave it a yank. There is no question that what happened next was a miracle, but there is a sort of academic controversy over the details. The Pune Critical Edition simply states that as Dushasan removed Draupadi's single garment, a second garment magically appeared in its place. Dushasan angrily ripped off the second garment, only to see it replaced by a third. Everyone in the hall gasped in astonishment at this miracle, until Bhima broke the spell by angrily swearing an oath. Take to heart this oath of mine, that I will forfeit my place in heaven with my ancestors if I do not tear open in battle the chest of this misbegotten fiend and drink his blood. The noble audience all cheered Bhima, while Dushasan, exhausted, ashamed, and surrounded by a pile of discarded clothes, finally gave up stripping Draupadi and sat down with his brothers. For those of you familiar with this classic scene, you will no doubt have noticed what is wrong with the story. We all know that when Draupadi was ordered to strip, she called to Krishna Govinda for aid. Krishna, who was presumably at home in Dwarka, heard her prayer, and he personally intervened and ensured that Draupadi was spared this final humiliation. I will discuss the reasons why this vital detail was excised from the official version, 
but suffice it to say for now that the scholars in charge of compiling the critical edition of the Mahabharata decided that this detail was a later addition to the story and therefore left it out. In any case, everyone agrees that at the sight of his wife's maltreatment, Bhima swore to drink Dushasan's blood, and that ended the episode. Perversely, Vidor then attempted to revive the hair-splitting question of whether Draupadi had been fairly won, even telling a story to illustrate a king's duty to adjudicate questions of Dharma. I'll spare you the story. It's not that interesting. Karna was not interested either, because once again he broke in and ordered Dushasan to take Draupadi to the slave quarters. The princess was not ready to go so quietly, and she dropped to her knees and demanded that she be allowed to properly greet her elder relatives in the hall. She once again insisted on having her case heard and judged by the elders. Bhishma again spoke up, but his brains were still addled. He just couldn't figure out what was right or wrong. He observed that Kripa and Drona were equally as confused as he. The old eunuch then lighted on the idea of putting the problem back on Yudhishthira. He said, Yudhishthira, I think, is the authority on this question. Let him speak out and say whether you have been one or not. Happy to see this confusion among his enemies, Duryodhana seconded Bhishma's suggestion. Why wouldn't King Dharma answer the question? Bhima and Arjun and the twins follow your orders, king, so answer the question. With a lecherous grin, Duryodhana then took a hold of his dhoti and looked invitingly at Draupadi. With a wink at Karna, he exposed his upper thigh. At this, Bhima literally blew his top. With fire blazing out of his eyes, ears, nose, and mouth, he swore to break that thigh with his club. As if to accompany this oath, the sound of braying donkeys, barking jackals, and the cries of carrion birds could be heard from around the sacred fire. At this horrible and inauspicious clamor, Bhishma, Drona, Kripa, and Vidor all called out, Shanti, Shanti, peace, peace, to dispel the omen. Finally, King Dhritarashtra snapped out of his delusion. You're lost, Duryodhana. Shit for brains. You have treated a married princess most uncouthly. Perhaps hoping to undo the damage, Dhritarashtra spoke at last to Draupadi. Choose a boon from me, Panchali, whatever you wish, for you are to me the most distinguished of my daughters-in-law, bent as you are on Dharma. Draupadi requested that her husband Yudhishthira be given back his freedom. She reasoned, that her son, spoiled as he was, would die of consternation to discover that he was now the son of a slave. The blind king then said, I give you a second boon, good woman. Ask me. My heart has convinced me that you do not deserve only a single boon. Draupadi said, With their chariots and bows, I choose Bhimasena and Dhananjaya, Arjun, Nakula and Sahadev as my second boon. Dhritarashtra then offered a third boon, saying, for of all my daughters-in-law, you are the best, for you walk in Dharma. And this time, Draupadi declined the offer. She said, Greed kills Dharma. I cannot make another wish, because I am not worthy to take a third boon from you. It is said that the commoner gets one boon, the Kshatriya gets two, but three are for kings, and a hundred for Brahmins. My husbands were laid low, but they have been saved. They will find the rest by their own acts. Karna observed this admiringly. Of all the famous women, none have accomplished such a deed. Bhima, however, was not at all consoled. Speaking to Arjun, he suggested they get up and kill everyone right then and there. His fury grew so great that once again smoke and fire came out of his ears and nose. Yudhishthira had to restrain him, putting his arm around him, saying, Stay quiet. Yudhishthira then approached the king with folded hands and asked him respectfully, O king, what should we do? Command us, you are our master and we shall always obey your wishes. The old king answered him, Go in peace. I give you leave to rule your kingdom with your own treasures. You have behaved nobly in this meeting. Therefore, my son, do not brood in your heart under Yodana's offensiveness. It was from affection that I allowed this dicing game, and I wish to see my friends and find out the strengths and weaknesses of my sons. Now return to your kingdom, and may your mind abide by the law. With that, the Dharma king and his queen and four brothers packed up and left for their kingdom. All's well that ends well, I suppose. This ends the story of the first dice game. Effectively, very little had changed. The Pandavas still had their freedom, titles, and possessions, but the drama of the gambling match would not be forgotten. Next episode, Duryodhana's guilt, envy, and fear will get the better of him, and he will make a preemptive strike against his cousins. The dicing games are not over quite yet. Thanks for listening. <laughs>